I, I would just well, uh, welcome back everyone to, to, to the event. Uh, we are entering now into the final part, uh, uh, which uh, everyone was, was expecting. So the expert panel discussion, and uh, I will leave the floor to the chairwoman, uh, Mariuka Ninoya. Yes, to, uh, very good. Yeah. <laughs> Not <laughs> to the facilitate. Spanish way. <laughs> yeah. I, I've, I've made my best. <laughs> So, uh, as to facilitate the, these these parts, and um, I will just uh, just remind you to to if you if you can to 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 fill the the Slido survey, so that um, maybe we can have some uh, interesting uh, uh, highlights uh, uh, for the end of the for the closing of the event. Yes, and now and I, I also, just yes, there were also questions about like related to the panel topics. Mm -hmm. So if you have already put any questions there or, or about to, then please do or, or put them in the chat. And we are a suitable amount of people <laughs> to allow people to even speak uh, their comments or ask their questions without a major hassle. So uh, be, be um, also prepared to kind of voice up your questions. Uh, but thanks, Monica, and we'll come back to Monica and, and the Slido results a bit later. And <clears throat> as we have everybody in the panel here, we can start. And the plan was actually to go through uh, the, the kind of main topics. So first starting from life cycle management, then discoverability and a bit of API design if we have time, and then security. So we have approximately one and a half hours, well, plus the closing words there, so one, one ish hours um, to have this talk and discussion. And there are definitely some topics that we wish that the audience <laughs> will also contribute answers because they might be either very specific or they might be very uh, kind of much something that other people from other uh, European community countries, for example, or the people who are here in the audience who are involved in a specific standard development might have something to say that we might not know about or we are not the best per persons to say. But kicking off, uh, Alan, would you want to tell a little bit about who you are and why do you think you are here? <laughs> Why I'm here is a good question. Uh, and so, yeah, my name is Alan Glickenhaus. I work for IBM. Uh, I am the digital transformation and API business strategist. And what that means is um, that I work with businesses uh, in the public and private sector all around the world um, on API strategy, API governance, lifecycle kinds of things is often the topic. Um, and um, I also speak at API Days conferences quite often. And uh, when I'm not doing that, I'm writing about it. So I'm either uh, writing blogs, papers, things like that. Uh, so now that I'm home a lot, there's more writing happening. But, but that's basically what I do. Yeah, I, I miss those uh, kind of corridor discussions <laughs> in API yeah. Days with you. Uh, so this is the next best, best thing. What about Lorenzino? Can you get a short introduction and please tell us if that uh, beautiful scenery is from Italy? Mm, okay, the second answer <laughs> before. No, it is not from Italy, but we have some <laughs> yeah. uh, landscapes like this one in Italy as well, close to the Lago Maggiore, where, where we live, uh, where I live. Um, and uh, the first question is, uh, who uh, am I? Me, I'm a computer scientist. I work uh, since uh, more or less 10 years ago for the Joint Research Center of the European Commission. Uh, I have worked for the private sector at the software developer at the beginning of my career. Then I w was working for more than 13 years on geographic information systems. And then I was working on open data and lately on uh, uh, APIs. And I'm really, um, I mean, impressed on the activity that there is around this topic uh, on API, which I consider the missing elements between the, let's say, the publication of open data and the use of open data for application. This is what I have learned. The main thing I have learned during these this two years and a half with the API days uh, uh, teams, uh, with all the public sector and the private sector uh, stakeholders that we have contacted during this time. 
and uh, that we tried to summarize in our reports also that we recently we, we published with a lot of collaboration with, with many people that are also in the, in the list of participants. So uh, let's say that this project is quite interesting. As uh, Monica was saying, we started it in 2018 with the request of uh, uh, DigiConnect, which is one of the directorate for the, uh, making the policies of the European Commission in terms of uh, digital governments and transformation of the digital society. And then uh, with the second follow-up project, which is the project within we are uh, working now, we are also collaborating with DigiDigit. Digit. Bogdan is uh, the representative and he makes a, a great presentation at the beginning of, of the, let's say, uh, the, the second session. Um, that's it, actually. I'm really curious and I'm really happy the, of the discussion that we have uh, had in the, in the chat, especially, and all the material that we have uh, to uh, work on and to produce the next, uh, the next uh, reports and outputs of, of this project to share uh, all of them uh, with you. So then I will leave uh, the floor to discuss about the questions so that we not yeah. keep uh, more time uh, for, for about me, let's say. Okay, <laughs> thanks a lot. Yeah. I, I will just really shortly uh, say that my my background is in, in I started with public sector APIs and web services, they were then called. We were just in the onset of ser uh, service oriented architecture at that time and Finland had just joined the European Union and we had to build some uh, agriculture and forestry benefit systems and there I got into this first idea of public and private sector because it wasn't only public sector using those APIs but they were used to build systems that the farmers were using and, and the software vendors for farmers were using and a lot of other uh, private sector organizations and that kind of brings me <laughs> to the first topic of ours so life cycle management and there has been a question uh, by one of the, the earlier speakers that how should you handle major API changes? So for example, in this agriculture and forestry system um, case, it was chaotic if some change happened at the middle of the benefit uh, round. <laughs> so because there were these big sanctions coming in from European Union and sometimes it's not that bad, but sometimes it is horrible to have a change in API. So how should that be done in a proper way. So there, there is a need for, for this uh, person who's asking this to hear about good examples of how others have done it and how to not break the backward compatibility and so on. So who would want to answer this? Alan, would you want to address this favorite subject of yours? Sure, yeah. So um, yeah. yeah, I'm not sure it's my favorite subject, but uh, it's nobody's <laughs> favorite subject, I don't think. So. Um, yeah, I guess the first thing to say about this is, if at all possible, try to avoid it, right? So, so um, you know, obviously we want to create backward compatible APIs as much as possible. Uh, sometimes that won't happen, and I, I will get to answering that piece of it. But, <laughs> but uh, the 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 you know, I think the first thing to think about is, you know, what are the best practices around trying to create something that's backward compatible, and and. Um, the more you do that, the less you have to deal with the difficulty of major breaking changes, right? So, so you know, one I'll just uh, one quick statement on that topic would be try to have consumer-oriented APIs versus provider-oriented APIs. Um, the more you're focused on what the consumer wants from you um, and ask for uh, information that's the minimal amount they need to give you, but not based on what the back-end systems look like, uh, the more likely you are to have a non-breaking change when something changes on the back end, right? So if you build the APIs based on the back end, every time the back end changes, you're going to have uh, a breaking change. So, so that's that half of the, the equation. Uh, now, even with that, you will occasionally have breaking changes. Uh, and so, you know, there's a whole series of things that, that you want to do in that space um, to move people forward. First of which is, probably at, at the beginning when they're signing up for the API, have information about what your policy is going to be um, for the, line, the amount of time that you plan to give them to migrate to new versions, right? So you're upfront and, and telling them about that. Um, in, in the life cycle itself of the API, you want to have uh, stages 
that you can move APIs into so that, first of all, you want to be able to have multiple APIs uh, available, version one and version two um, at the same time. But, but when version two is becoming available, you want to stop people from signing up for version one, right? And, 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 and so you want to move that into a life cycle state that nobody else can now sign up for it. So you don't have to deal with new people coming onto that one. And then obviously notify the registered users of that API that there is a version two out there. Um, try to sell the fact that it's much better and, 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 and that they should move to it and tell them how long that you're giving them, you know, remind them uh, for moving that forward. And, and hopefully, you know, you'll see people start to move, but occasionally there'll be people that, you know, straggle along uh, later. And, and so, you, you know, you want to see from your analytic data um, who is still using that older version of the API, send them out periodic reminders, um, you know, and, and I've, I've dealt with many businesses that have fought, you know, fought with this battle. And, um, the, you know, you always get the one person who's hanging on and, and uh, you know, you have to kind of you know, talk to them and, and help them along. Um, but sometimes that's the biggest person that you got, right? That is your user. And, and if that's the case, taking it out on the day that you said you're going to take it out is, is not going to be something that's good for you or for them, right? So, so you have to be a little judicious in, in you know, who is this leftover user that, that's there? And mm -hmm. there isn't a great answer to that. I mean, you're, you're just going to have to work with them to get them to move forward. The, the best answer is try to avoid the problem and, and, and have backward compatible APIs. Yeah, and, and we see that a lot in private sector in different industries that the time can vary a lot per industry. So yeah. like sales, uh, sales for, like actually it was Shopify that was giving a talk actually in, in API is Helsinki. And, and they were saying that because of the financial nature of, of things in their platform, uh, there's a lot of times they have to support a few different versions for like a couple of years. I mean, public sector, I'm, I'm sure that this time can be kind of from the previous legislation to the next one. And, and this is kind of uh, a question for you, Lawrence, you know, what do you see as being the specific questions or challenges in, in public sector for this change management and information? Okay, if, if, if I have to uh, tell you an anecdote, at the beginning when I started working on this project with my colleagues, um, I had some interactions with the uh, MECTI at the beginning when we decided mm -hmm. to work together with the API this so 2018, uh, January, February, and David Berlin actually. And uh, they immediately told me, look, there are two main issues. Uh, the first one is the security, of course, and the second one is versioning. So pay attention in your reports and report and, uh, and investigate on how to improve these uh, things uh, about versioning and uh, try to ask people which are the methods they use and to solve this, this issue. I, from the personal experience, I have observed this, if I make a parallel in the open data uh, world, let's say when government, they publish their data sets on the vocabulary, on the catalog especially, after they publish them, they try, I mean, they kind of forget them. So it's a una tantum, you know, publication. Mm -hmm. And then in the, in the meanwhile, the open data, they evolve in their internal systems. And when the user is using this open data, uh, they realize that it is not the last version. So they go to the government, they say, oh, look, is this the last version? They say, no, no, this is not the correct version. The correct version is in my system. So, I mean, this updating of things in catalogs is I, also- a, a, I totally a know what you're talking about. Yeah. I, I, my favorite uh, example is the postal codes that yeah. can be wrong in so many places because people put them into, well, public sector people put them into all, all sorts of open yeah. data sets and they kind of fail to say that what is actually the life cycle of, you know, the postal yeah. code. When does yeah. it change and what happens when does it, when it changes? And if the open data set has been developed in public money with some project, then it stops and then the data set is not valid anymore and never updated, or at least in that same place. So, I, I, see, I see that the, the, the situation is improving now also because yeah. of the APIs, I have to say. In, in, the, in some of the catalogs, the channel of distribution of the data sets are APIs. And when you add an API on the top of the open data, you are obliged 
to, uh, let's say, version the data sets and the API because mm -hmm. you know that there are some apps built yeah. on, on the data now. And this is, very, uh, in, in the last times, is, is even more important because, as you might know, the last directive of open data from the European Commission requires for six, in six domains of, for high value data set to have mandatorily APIs. So the managing of the versioning of these APIs and of these data sets is particularly important because these data sets will be the main one of uh, which published by the public sector that can be used for the digital transformation of the society and the economy and the, for the support and the environmental uh, mm -hmm. changes, let's say. Okay, I can send the link if you want to. It, it would be good, and, and also yeah. if there are anybody, uh, any private sector people in the audience, especially those ones who kind of might want to use or are already using uh, the public sector APIs or others that uh, from public sector, for example, who have experience about either solving or facing this kind of life cycle <laughs> issue, then uh, please do not hesitate to comment and, and participate in the discussion. Um, we'll, we'll, in the meanwhile, when you're thinking about good questions to ask, we'll, we'll move into kind of another direction in the, the life cycle. And, and I think that the one thing you both said was about the information about when is stuff changing. And there are these services and, 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 and kind of ways to inform users automatically about changes in the API, uh, but do, do you see them being used in public sector uh, APIs or that should they be used or should public sector kind of invent a way in these API catalogs that we heard about um, to kind of push the information of the changes um, to the users? So how, how do you see that, Alan? For example, do you have a kind of a private sector or a public sector? I'm not sure. I, I, I I'm not sure. I differentiate between the sectors. I was yeah. not 100 sure I understood what you were saying. But, yeah, but, but I, I was kind of asking because there yeah. are these services where you can kind of say that, hey, post to my users that my API has a change, so they're automatically kind of pulling. Yeah, I mean, it, 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 I can speak to what we do in our product, which yeah. is, you know, we give you an ability to notify the registered users of an API that yeah. it's changing, it's an email, right? So we said, you know, an administrative role can send an email to the registered users of a particular version of the API that, hey, there's a new one out there or, you know, some information that you want to say about that API. So so if there's a time when it's going to be down for some reason or something like that, you want to notify them, um, you know, that that's a mechanism to do that. But certainly I agree that the idea of posting it on the portal um, is, is another good place. I'm not sure necessarily that people come back and look at the portal after. No, no, uh, like, yeah. there, there are these headers and, and, and there are also these kind of um, retired or, or uh, kind of flags in the API calls that might say that some attributes are, for example, mm. um, going to retire or, or you know, deprecated or things like that. So, so even though there are a lot of cases where you know, the manual work of pushing <laughs> the email to the users or having that version uh, number in the URL are working, but there are also these other ways yeah. and, and, and kind of not deprecating the whole version of the API, but, but some parts of it and then using uh, automation to kind of provide the info of what has changed um, to the users. So have you any experience? Yeah, I don't really if, have a lot of experience with that. Yeah, yeah, okay. I, I mean, the only other thing I can say is uh, obviously if you're trying, I mean, sometimes again, deprecation is another issue that, um, you know, if you've got parameters you don't need anymore or something like that, you know, if somebody gives you them, ignore it, right? I mean, you don't have to necessarily break, break something to, uh, you know, um, have uh, you know the old parameters still come in and, and not harm anything um, or if there's a conversion you can do from the old way that they were doing it to the new so that it's not a change they necessarily have to make that you can make through an automated uh, transformation of some sort um, that's another way to avoid um, you know them having to make changes I mean the whole the whole you know, I've been thinking a lot about this lately the, the you know why do people create apis and and the answer is, because you want somebody to use it, right? And, mm -hmm. and, 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 you know, the only, the best way to get somebody to use it is to make their life easier. And, and, and 
more you can make their life easier by not having to have breaking changes and, uh, and, and you know, simpler interfaces and things like that, the, the more likely you are to get people to use your API, right? So, um, yeah, yeah, but yeah. The, the detail on that, I'm not, I, I don't have any experience. With. Yeah, yeah, I mean, like, we, we had this co-working group in Finland discussing uh, for the last year that what is a truly open API, and we came to the conclusion that it is an API that has users or has potential to have users, <laughs> and, and all of this, uh, kind of standardization and and, and uh, using good design and, and informing your users is part of that um, yeah. kind of openness. Um, okay, so we don't have any questions now from our audience unless there just came. Um, no, so then we'll go forward to actually just a kind of a uh, very very detailed topic, but. Uh, now that everything is going to microservices and very distributed solutions, uh, how does this, in your opinion, impact these kind of API changes and, and, and monitoring and being able to even handle this um, ever-changing architecture that we have? Uh, there's also an organizational question to this that kind of um, the, from the French administration's point of view, the question is that, is it how to handle this organizationally? <laughs> because there are all these kind of big teams versus fast and lean teams. And if you have this microservices architecture, is it going to be a whole lot to handle, um, both technically and organizationally? Any answers to that? Um, Alan or yeah, yeah, I think I'll, I'll start. Uh, I, I mean, I, I, you know, I, typically I'm the business strategist, right? So, so, <laughs> so I, I get into the, that kind of thing. But but yeah, I mean, the, the architecture and and the components is something that that is an issue that we deal with a lot. And and I, I guess the first thing to say here is to differentiate between what an API is and what a microservice is, right? That they're, they're not the same thing, and, and people often use them interchangeably or incorrectly, and and maybe even make the assumption that every microservice has an API um, that is managed um, and, and that's not correct, right? So, so, you know, APIs are about consumption and about access to a capability. Microservices is an architectural style that provides capabilities. Um, so, so they're related to one another, but they're not the same. And, and, and so, you know, microservices architecture, I just read, I think, a, a blog about this from somebody else just today or yesterday, um, you know, that, that, that mentioned, you know, people are so excited about microservices, but here's all the things that, you know, they're not great for, right? And, and so I think consider microservices a tool in your toolbox and, and use it appropriately. And, and what it's good for is agility in, in the creation of capabilities, right? But that should be a separate discussion from what APIs are we exposing to a consumer, and and, and you know the consumer might be a, a separate microservice application that's located in a different place. Um, so one microservice application that's on premise could call another microservice application that's in a cloud somewhere, and, and you might use an API for that um, because it's transitioning from one application to another. But but inside the applications you know, they refer to it as east-west traffic, you, you don't want to put an API in between each one of these these microservices, right? You're just going to have incredible overhead if you do that and, you know, not necessary. So so I, I think, you, you know, multiple parts of the question there on organizational structure and... and, uh, and yeah, I, I, can, uh, I can kind of <laughs> enlighten yeah. that organizational structure point and and, and kind of tie it in with a question that Monica posted in the chat for Lorenzino. So we could uh, kind of move into the more kind of research of, uh, and, and organizational point of the question that uh, when I was co-authoring the API Economy 101 book, we, we skimmed through a lot of research and, and some of it was really good in terms of it, it, it resonated with my own experience about uh, kind of integration paradigm versus a ecosystem paradigm in terms of like having these uh, teams, independent teams and independent teams with, uh, uh, within the organization and, and outside of the organization 
that can actually work together uh, when they are APIs, when they are kind of exposing the capabilities to each other with the APIs, and I can I can pull out that specific research where that was in. But Lorenzino, you are kind of looking at this from a research point of view. What do you think? Uh, about, Let's say uh, I was just yeah. reading the last uh, answer yeah. from, uh, from Eric, <laughs> which uh, I, I was thinking uh, about monoliths in the public administration <laughs> as well. Let's say that, they, I mean, I have worked for public administration for some time and uh, what I found that it's it's sometimes a bit more complex than a, let's say a single focus uh, company uh, because there are a lot of departments and each department is a kind of silo and they develop their own services and their own, uh, let's say, um, I don't call them microservices because I don't have many, many examples of, of uh, public administration that are using microservices also because they are even behind the API, so they are even more hidden, you know, with respect to the APIs. Mm -hmm. And uh, I know that some of them are using, uh, for example, the French administration, as, as Patrick uh, uh, was saying, but then there is this difficulty to exchange this information about these small software modules of who is doing what. And sometimes you realize that you have the same module that uh, the uh, two different models are doing the same thing. So, but this is a good uh, thing for the transition, in my opinion, from the monolith, uh, you know, uh, um, system of some public administration to a more modularity. Uh, systems and also to make these departments talk each, each other because you start from the technical uh, issue. You, you say, look, we are doing this software that is supporting uh, maybe two different services, so can we share it and so on. So you try to discuss at the organizational level what you can do to join the resources, to reuse the software, to make better public services for the, for the, for the citizens. But let's say that, that's a I see it a, a bit uh, behind the, the, some public administration, this, this use of microservices. And that's why I'm also curious to know from, from the public as well and, and from the participant, uh, if they have some particular case that they would like to highlight uh, that they can find this, either the microservices useful, uh, you know, for this interaction and reuse of software, or maybe a, a bit difficult to manage because this, requires, of course, as, as when you modularize your software, you require the kind of organization and coordination between these microservices. But then the, from the research point of view, I have something to ask. That my vision is that in, in some time you have all these small agent systems that should talk each other, should co-organize, but this is a kind of research issue that I don't want, I don't want to uh, discuss it now, just to, to mention. Great. So I posted the uh, article uh, details that I was mentioning in the chat. So I think we have kind of exhausted a little bit about <laughs> the, the kind of life cycle discussion now. And looking at the time, I think that we could move into discoverability. And, and we were actually hearing a lot of great examples of API catalogs and, and kind of the idea of discoverability through those those catalogs and there was even this discussion about should the open api spec and and some other measures be taken in in kind of looking at the kind of productization data and metadata of the apis and so uh the first kind of topic is that are there any examples of public and private sectors creating common arenas to discuss and maybe provide api catalogs and is the trend going in some other direction like public sector only API catalogs, well, we heard a few, but actually my addition to that question is that should we even thinking, be thinking of API catalogs? Is there another way to think about discoverability? Who wants to take this? Alan, do you sure, have- Sure, sure. I mean, actually, um, yeah, I think I'll hit on a part of this big yeah. topic. Um, I mean, this is a topic I've been speaking about a lot lately at the different API days conferences, uh, ecosystems, marketplaces, and platforms is the topic that uh, I've been presenting. And, and I am seeing a lot of interest in this. Uh, success is another story, but um, uh, the, uh, the um, concept of putting together um, a customer journey that might include um, private sector and public sector 
together solutions that a customer is trying to do. An example being um, uh, uh, somebody wants to move their house. You know, I'm moving mm -hmm. from one location to another. And, and there are things you have to do in, in the private sector to actually arrange a move and, and buy a house and do all those things and maybe find, get insurance and, 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 and a bank and, and all the other things that you have to do. But there's also driver's license and, and you know, the other things that change on the government side. And so putting together a solution that's customer oriented in an ecosystem is something that a lot of businesses are starting to look at. Um, back to the question of, so how should that work from an API uh, discoverability perspective, um, th there's a lot that goes into that from uh, a marketplace perspective. And, and and one of the things that I talk about in the presentation, I'm not going to go through the 25 minutes here, um, <laughs> is what are you stepping up to doing, right? So, so I mean, you can have a, a marketplace like Programmable Web. I don't know if everybody's familiar with Programmable Web, but but it's basically like a, just a list of, of, of APIs. It's a searchable list and it's categorized and you can go find an API, but they're saying nothing about the API uh, itself. The, the, you know, whoever provides the API says this is what it does, but there's no verification that it actually does that or is, is gonna be scalable or secure or any of the things you want. It's just a place to go find APIs. Uh, that's okay. Uh, I mean, if that's what you want, want to provide. Uh, other you know, businesses that want to sign up and use the APIs that, that are in a marketplace want to know that this is a reputable API. It's good. I should be comfortable mm -hmm. using it. And, and you as the owner of this marketplace, are you saying that? Are you standing behind this? Are you doing any kind of vetting in, uh, of the APIs that you're putting in your marketplace? If you're willing to step up to that, you've got more value in your marketplace. But if you're not, then, then what, what is the value that, that you're providing? And, and I guess the last thing I'll say on this topic, and I'll let somebody else take a shot, is, you know, we are seeing this. Um, so in certain industries, uh, telecom is the one that immediately comes to mind. Um, there are organizations that are publishing, you know, APIs so that the telecom industry can work across geographies, right? That, that you know, you can make a call from one country to another. Um, and, and, and it works and, and the billing works and all the other things that have to go into that, right? So, so you know, these kinds of standards and, and common places to go find what the APIs are, are existing. So um, and I think this is going to be a trend that, that more and more yeah. was. I, I totally agree. I'm like ecosystem customer journeys and APIs is kind of my favorite topic to talk also. And and, and I often I often kind of see when, when I'm training people and companies on that, that it kind of opens their eyes and, and it would be wonderful to see these kind of ecosystem journey uh, models also in the API catalog and, and mixing up these private and public sector APIs because there is also this problem that no API catalog otherwise can solve that. For example, if I'm, I've been working in you know, with uh, big private sector companies and they have had a need for, well, my favorite thing, postal code or some, some other, you know, government thing uh, or public sector thing that they have needed. Uh, the data might have been also available from some commercial sources and that's fine, but they never in these big companies actually even find or know that there is a government or public sector uh, resource available for that. So all of this open data, for example, effort in some cases even goes wasted. Uh, if we just talk about open data and uh, interfaces, uh, then because this, this, uh, this audience doesn't know that it exists, let alone these other APIs. And of course, there's the whole like, yes, you can discover these APIs, but can you actually then use them? Are they kind of having the proper SLAs? And because the catalogs often are not uh, API management solutions, they don't actually provide access or rate limits or anything else, which is probably, <clears throat> Alan, your <laughs> kind of favorite topic, but I'm, I'm stealing it a bit. But how do you see uh, this Lorenzino and, and, and kind of, um, we, we kind of answered already this should all APIs in a marketplace satisfy the same guidelines a bit, but we, we should get back to that first um, wonderful question there. Lorenzino, have you got an opinion on this? 
topic? I, I, actually, yeah, actually, I, uh, I try to connect this uh, need of uh, kind of API marketplace, common API marketplace and extend it to the common data marketplace. And the European uh, Commission between his priorities uh, has the one of, uh, it is called a Europe, a Europe fit for the digital age that has a, a, an European data strategy. And within this European data strategy, there is this aims to make uh, the European Union a, a sharing data sets between people, business and organization, both from the private and the public sector. I, can, I will share the link that is discussing uh, this uh, in, um, in, uh, in the site of the European uh, Commission. And I, I see that there is a, I mean, you can understand that there is a strong uh, uh, willingness to join and to merge all these data sets and to use the best uh, of them for the benefit of citizens and of society, of course, but there are also concrete, uh, concrete initiatives that puts this, makes these data spaces in some uh, domains that uh, we also discuss in, in, the, in, the, in the report when we try to identify the priority uh, domains for which APIs could be, could be useful uh, and, and could, could support, let's say, to improve the, the provision of public services. And there is this uh, very strong uh, um, willingness to make a common, a common marketplace, common data space to share this data set and to share the knowledge and the information and build the information on these on this data sets. And I think that, again, I, I know that I'm repetitive, but what I have learned is that APIs are really the missing uh, uh, piece that we have to uh, enhance and let the policy makers and decision makers understand that these are this is the, the channel that should be used to disseminate and make this data set interacting and, uh, I mean, understanding which data set are available, which are the best one, which, are the, which is the quality of the data set, and to build apps on it, which is the, and public services, which is the final goal, let's say, of, of APIs and the sharing these data sets, one of the final goals, at least. Mm -hmm. So you know, let me jump back in. I mean, yeah. the question from Bert and and Mika there on on, on the service level yeah, agreements. I'm going to actually go and, there. So go ahead. Yeah. yeah, I I mean, you know, there's a technical side to uh, a standard set of guidelines or a certain level of quality of service, and 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 there's um, a, a a marketplace owner, you know, might say, if you're going to be in my marketplace, you need to meet X amount or more of you know, some level of agree, uh, service level. Um, but the other thing that I don't think these questions are, are hitting is the business side of it, right? So, so you know, when I talk about you know, creating ecosystems and marketplaces, that you, let's say you want to build an ecosystem of yourself and whatever other organizations you should work with uh, to provide a solution. And the APIs, as, as Lorenzino said, you know, are the great way that that, that we can get these organizations to work together because I can consume APIs from others and put together this solution. The challenge is what's the business relationship? And, and, and if you think about, you know, what goes on historically in this space, um, there's a business discussion between two organizations that says, here's how we'd like to work together. And, you know, that could take a long time until you get that settled and then you create uh, or give access to the APIs uh, that you need to implement that. And, and so the API, solution provides a quick onboarding that we didn't have before and great so we've solved the technical side of of partnering together but not the business side because we continually have to have these long discussions about how we're going to work together right so so the question that i pose in the marketplace area is can we solve the business problem there uh, and can we put out standards um for guidelines for how we're going to work together as businesses and if you know we agree that that this is how we'll work together as in the, um, there are multiple um, organizations that all do similar kinds of things that would consume your APIs so here's the way you know we're going to have a business relationship uh, the financial arrangements or whatever they may be um, you know, and, and put that in the, the portal or wherever it needs to be in the extended portal um, that today doesn't really handle business relationship onboarding. Um, you know, that would be a big move forward in creating a, a solution for consumers, right? And I think, you know, that's, that's the, the yet to be found um, 
uh, you know, golden There's nugget. no standard for that. Yeah, right. So, <laughs> yeah. so, you know, marketplaces are starting to experiment with that and, and see what can we do. And, and the answer is going to, to probably be, you know, the old 80, 20 rule, right? So if I can, if I can do a standard kind of a way that people will work with me and it works for 80% of the people that want to work with me, then that's great, you know, and, and I'll deal with the other 20% if, if I want to, right? You know, or maybe 80% is, is enough. And that, you know, I'll just take everybody that wants to yeah, sign up. Yeah. I, I totally agree. And, and, and we have had a Finnish solution for this. It's called, let's go to the sauna together because that has worked very well in making very quick business decisions in the past. But the problem is that of course, that doesn't really apply to APAS and what I'm seeing in public sector catalogs, one, one particular problem there is that while they are kind of nicely bringing these uh, APIs to uh, kind of a list of things and you can find them and search them probably, uh, if they still need, like if individual API in order for you to use it as an organization requires this kind of word document filling or some kind of other very, very complex process of getting accepted as a user and you have to go through the exactly same thing with each and every one of those APIs, it's not going to fly because unless you are like dying to have exactly that IP or, or more importantly if there's a law requiring you with a lot of sanctions to use that API then you might be able to do that or if you're a big organization but for a small organization that's never going to work and and uh, that kind of goes to the kind of yes this is a business problem but then there's this kind of technical issues and and, and the guidelines kind of covering that and the question often in public sector is about data models, for example, and, and about um, kind of standards and, and other things related to how the data looks, how the endpoint looks, what are the kind of um, authorizations to it or something. And, and Mika is bringing up this very good point of service level agreements, but is, is that actually strictly necessary? Can we have this? APIs that are kind of slightly different, slightly differently modeled or not so standard or at least not using the exact same, same standard. Maybe they're all using open API, but maybe they're not using the same data models. Is that going to be a problem or could there be categories in the marketplace or, or could they just live along nicely? Um, I'll let Lawrence, you know, take first this and then I, I know Alan, you have an opinion to this. <laughs> And, and if anybody in the audience has an opinion, please do share. Lorenzino, what do you have in mind? Okay, what I have learned during uh, my research uh, pre pre previously to come to the GRC is that building an, a, a universal ontology uh, or define the semantics of the whole data models uh, that have to be used is, is not possible. It's, it's I mean, it's, it's impossible to have, uh, you know, a common data model for everybody. So we have to find a way to link this data model between uh, uh, them. And the linked data initiative, for example, is a various initiatives, a lot of initiatives is, can help, but it's quite difficult to use it to bring from uh, research or pilots to the business and to the public sector. We are trying to do some uh, uh, we have some uh, projects and one of the conferences, by the way, about this is the semi conference that will be uh, quite soon. I don't remember the date. And there is also Eric uh, uh, Wild that will participate to the, uh, to the, uh, uh, as a keynote and we'll talk about this uh, uh, APIs for public sector uh, as well. And maybe about this, and you can see all the other presentation that we talk about this semantic aspects, especially the interoperability layer of semantic, um, about semantic in this conference organized by the European Commission. So you will have a lot of uh, discussion about this particular aspect. As I was saying, it is impossible to build a universal, uh, let's say ontology, but it is possible to make some, let's say matching between this kind of this different ontologies. And this is what we have to do. We are uh, trying, for example, in this project to make uh, some experiments on how to match the different, uh, uh, the different uh, uh, files of uh, open API specification. 
I, for example, I'm a researcher, I would I define an open API uh, specification file that to search other similar APIs on the web. And I'm trying to use, we are trying to use semantic matching, let's say between different vocabularies and, and meaning of, of the data models and the API, but it's quite difficult. I don't have any, uh, let's say, apart from some project like the API Harmony that was from IBM, if I'm, I'm not wrong, uh, I don't have any other uh, experiences on how to find the right data model with the right API for a particular use. But of course, uh, I think we have to improve it then uh, there is a lot of research to do in this field, I think. And, uh, and by the way, I just uh, link uh, an initiative that I was uh, recently uh, engaged with, uh, which is called the Smart Data Models, and it's a uh, um, um, government, government, both by the, I, I think there are some private and public sector uh, organization in, the, in there, and they are trying to build some uh, common data models and on the top of which there will be APIs, of course, that can be shared with the private and public sector. Excellent. Alan, do you have... Yeah, I, I mean, I think they covered it between Eric's Embrace Diversity and, and Lorenzino's comments. <laughs> uh, I, I mean, I, you can't do it. Uh, you, you know, I, I, IBM tried, I think, in the 1990s. Um, mm. uh, you know, we, we, we tried to create this Uber uh, definition that everybody was supposed to use in and after a year of trying to get everybody to agree to it, then, then it was out of date. You know, you, you just, yeah. um, it's not gonna work, you know, so. Yeah, I, 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 I hear you. I mean, like, uh, uh, back in about 2006 or something, I swore that if I ever heard the word ontology again, <laughs> I would like do something desperate. Uh, because back in that time, everybody was trying to kind of find, find the Rosetta Stone in ontologies and it became just ridiculous. Yeah. And I'm not saying that that work was not kind of important and there are, there are things that kind of rely on that, but it was a lot of work for not so much effort or like impact at that time. But the good thing was that we might have come into same data model with, uh, you know, how a company is, is represented inside Finland at least <laughs> at that time. <laughs> but that that almost required people to go to Sonos to to kind of actually <laughs> to have an, uh, a conclusion on that. But hey, um, so we have a good set of links in the chat, um, and there is that all important discussion about DCAT. Um, DCAT e API, I have no idea how to actually even say that in English, <laughs> but, but um, so this is an interesting topic, although the question is, is it kind of yet related to APIs or not, or rather kind of API data sets more? Um, does Mika want to actually talk about this because we had a question about this actually uh, before and, and we had a discussion with Lorenzino about how to approach this. So if I will unmute um, Mika, wait a minute. Um, yes, now you can talk Mika. Okay, so can you hear me? Yes. Okay, so basically the DCAT AP, uh, uh, this kind of metadata uh, model, what, which is all the European uh, uh, countries are using basically kind of describe the open data sets and more, more about APIs. Also, so there's some, in, in the latest version, there's some kind of uh, attributes how to describe, describe the APIs and, and it's, it's going that way, but, but still there's like, I think five different kind of uh, attributes how to describe the open data API. So it's not good yet, but it, it could be, it, let's, say, let's say version three or version four could be mm. quite good. So it, it, it's, it's depending on how they going to kind of uh, move that uh, thinking forward basically so and and I, I would I have really bad communication issues. Uh, I, I did change my computer uh, in, during this break. So basically in Finland we have two, two kind of uh, two different kind of uh, uh, API catalogs. So we have one for Axroad. So basically Axroad is handling the personal information. So the security server and all the structure is really heavy and it's not, we cannot use it that for uh, basically open data. 
And then we have second one for, for open APIs, basically, and open data. So we have like two, two, two different kind of uh, uh, catalogs for different kind of information. So in public sector, we have a lot of uh, uh, personal information and that can, cannot be uh, open data. And then we have a lot of open data information and we have to have like different kind of ways to handle those. So basically we are using the X road or, or uh, this, is, this structure for personal information more. And then we have to have a different kind of architecture for open data. So basically no, that's the best thing, but they are not, basically they are not like API management solutions. They are more like catalog things because mm -hmm. they are based on, on CCAN, open, open source CCAN, and it's not so good of, of, well, basically it's not API management solution at all. So, but anyway, yeah. Uh, Brett is bringing up a, a point on, on that this is exactly about breaking the DCAT API, AP. I mean, Claude, where do you get these <laughs> acronyms in, in European Commission? <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> if, if, if uh, you, Mika, or if, if Laurentino or Alan know anything more about this, um, please um, share <laughs> shortly. <laughs> Yeah, well, I, I could say that in Finland, we have this semantic stuff. They, they are creating, we have like this national open source tool for that. And now they are thinking how to put this, they want to describe the information. So basically what the data models or what the, what the words are really meaning. So they want mm -hmm. to describe it because it's really uh, important for, for instance, if, if you think about legislation, so you have to understand the law the same way. So basically they want, they, they have one tool for that and then they want to, they, then they are thinking how to kind of put, put this, this tool part of the kind of uh, API creation, how to kind of use that tool to kind of de define all the kind of words, what you're using in your API. And then when you have done your uh, basically data model, semantic data model, then you, then you move forward to kind of build build the real API. So basically you can use the open API definition or something like that. And then you will put publish, but there's, uh, we have really fragmented kind of a whole picture. Basically we don't have yet any kind of real model, which isn't describing the whole, whole kind of a uh, whole thing. So we are coming up and trying different kind of things to coming up some kind of that kind of uh, uh, model. Okay, so Eric is bringing up this uh, point of, of Schema.org and, and uh, it has this web API vocabulary defined there, which I actually linked into the chat. And this kind of brings me into the whole point of private versus public way of, you know, solving these issues. Because in, in private sector, we look a lot in the Schema.org and, and this kind of stuff, because it just makes sense from uh, kind of enough of standardization, enough of interoperability, and plus it improves the search engine results <laughs> quite often. So uh, if we look at something like this or from IBM, for example, I, I personally loved a, a lot the, the kind of way when I first saw it in, in API Connect where you have this kind of product um, YAML or product JSON on top of the actual API uh, definition with open API or, or, or other things. So, so kind of, I think that that's missing and we actually discussed that in the chat too, but if we look at these different approaches to defining an API uh, in an interoperable way, so any kind of ideas that this uh, takes us to. Alan, do you have any? I, I I don't. Uh, I, I mean, I, I think you know this is one of these things that that the world is going to continue to um, to move forward, right? And, and so you start with an open API spec that talks about what the API you know interface should should be, and, and then we'll move forward to the next level of product and and whatever is beyond that, maybe ecosystem in the future or something, but. Uh, but I, I think that, you know, there's, uh, as they used to say, inventions yet to be uh, scheduled. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah. Some place, yeah. Yes. Okay. Uh, then I think that we're kind of approaching the topic of 
API design and, and, and then kind of the security stuff that we were asked about. And, and, and when I, before I actually go to those, if, if um, Monica, you have any questions from the audience or do through the Slido, then just interrupt me uh, related to the life cycle or discoverability. I'll, I'll double check. I, uh, we, ha we don't have that many um, replies. Um, let me just check. Where is it? No worries. I mean, people just remember to fill in the poll and, and, and we can get, come back to that at the end because we have no, still I, a lot of good questions <laughs> interoperability no um, most of them are, are are on the design part i think so yeah. let's, okay. let's move to the next yeah. let's let's move to the design then so and this is kind of crossing from some part of the discoverability and, and moving towards the security so the, we are in that kind of mixed zone here but um the first question was that uh, polling versus web sockets versus other approaches. So this was what um, actually uh, Bogdan was was coming with uh, in the first set of part one two. So kind of he has more detailed questions here. Mistakes to avoid. What should be designed as part of REST APIs and what should be used, uh, MQTT used for and and actually, I would bring into the table also GraphQL and gRPC and async API and all the rest of it, uh, pun intended. So, any any thoughts on this, uh, Alan? Yeah, yeah, sure. So, you know, I think I I, I saw our other spe speakers at API Days conferences speak about this. I I wrote some things on the state of the API economy and presented that at a few conferences as well. And I said the definition of of an API is changing. Um, <laughs> In some ways, I, I, so so the the um, the the concept of an API, as in I want to make something that is consumable and and easy to, to use and and all that, remains the same. The technology that underlies it is changing, right? So so you know historically we thought about APIs as REST and and maybe SOAP, um, you know, and, and that was it. Uh, and, and now we're seeing that we need asynchronous and gRPC and you know and all these other ones. And, and so I want APIs that have different models, you know, that have different technologies. And and, and there isn't a one size fits all that REST is the answer to everything. And and, and I think that's goodness, right? So the more we uh, we have different tools for different purposes, events, you know, is something that's really hot right now. Um, people are starting to think events solves everything in the world, right? And it, it doesn't either, but, but it's another tool in the toolbox. And I think if you start to think about APIs in, in the larger sense of let's have consumable assets and then let's figure out what the right pattern for how to access them is, um, then you're, you're in the right direction. Yeah, I think that if we go kind of uh, exactly from the kind of purpose of, of uh, Zapier introduced that rest, uh, let's stop the polling madness <laughs> some years back and I really loved it and and there are so many cases where polling is bad and and yeah. pushing is, is kind of um, much better use case but then you have to also consider that you might miss, miss stuff so how to kind of require that and then there's this huge large-scale uh, IoT scenarios where we might agree that MQTT has its, its very good use cases, but on the other hand, that has a lot of, uh, kind of, it might be slower, it might be, uh, in terms of payload, it might be smarter, but, uh, but all these kind of, uh, how did I say, socket and event-based and stream-based ways like TRPC and, and, and MQTT and ASYNC API, they kind of rely on the fact of, of well, not not async API. Let's move that from that. But uh, MQTT and gRPC, for example, they rely on on the known servers, known clients, and and trusted clients paradigm. And and that's not always the case. That might be the case that we saw from from, uh, for example, Bogdan's presentation in in the e-delivery, or or we might see that in some part of the NIS or an X road stuff 
but kind of where does that go? Where, where, what should we use? Uh, Lorenz Zenon, do you know a little bit more about these kind of use cases that have come up with, with the, inside the European Commission work? So what do you say? And we have also Roberto's comment. There. I, yeah, I, I know, I, I, I don't know too much from the, let's say, technical point of view because I'm more oriented on open data and REST APIs and the <laughs> query response model. Uh, but at the beginning of my career, I was working on sensors and industrial, um, and uh, industrial, let's say, systems. But I see that the world has changed a lot from that, those years. Mm -hmm. And now there is this movement about with smart cities, you know, and and the web of things, and small devices that goes around and talk to each other. And uh, yes, I think that there is the need to define, um, let's say, a common specification or some specification to manage all this information that will come, uh, especially also for the evolution of the next networks, uh, the 5G. You know, everybody's talking about 5G and a lot of amount of information that is will come from these uh, devices all around our uh, environment. And yeah, I mean, the challenge is quite uh, is quite um, hard to to solve. And how we collect this information, how we use it, them, which kind of models. Uh, what I have learned is that we, from the Async API conferences and the different uh, ways to collect this information is that there is an entire universe to be explored uh, beside the, the, let's say, the query response or the uh, RPC uh, models. Um, but then which kind of solution are out there? It's a bit uh, difficult to say. I know that, for example, in the geographic sector, there is this, uh, uh, some specification. One of them is called uh, sensor things and it's uh, using APIs as well. But I think that this, uh, this is uh, not enough. We, we need more, uh, more efforts to find some different uh, uh, solutions that maybe are out there. So I invite uh, some, some of the uh, participants either to write the, the knowledge about this solution or to intervene in the in the discussion. What do you think, Mariuka? Yeah, <laughs> that sounds like a plan. And, and I think that uh, also what we should include at least in this conversation today is that there is no one size fits all. I mean, like, it's not a question of uh, should I use REST or should I use MPP? It, it's not like that. I mean, like, if you are serving customers who you don't kind of know in advance or there's an internet between and there's like the normal networking and the normal um, uh, kind of mobile apps or, or something else they're using consuming the API then REST or GraphQL actually might be a best answer for that but then if you have like for example gRPC is super fast and super great but you need uh, those files to to be on the, the, the each end of the call and, uh, and and kind of have to use protobuf and, and and other things and and it's kind of like there is no API management solution that I know that works with that unless Alan has some secret knowledge <laughs> <laughs> on that. well no there isn't uh, yes. uh, but you know one of the things we are looking at and I, we've done some of it already is, mm. is to try to not not the complete list that we just had but but you know for many different styles of integration to put them together into an offering so we have something in IBM called the cloud pack for integration which includes API and Kafka and files and you know a bunch of other stuff that that you can basically buy and use whichever one of these you want right so so we are saying that there is multiple different protocols and multiple different styles that you're going to to want and i expect that um and i'm not announcing anything here but the you know that that the list is is, is not going to be what it is today and you know at some point in the future other things will get added as well and and that's good um so you know, this becomes a, a larger set of tools that you get to work with than just API. Yeah. And, and you know, we will want to do things like have a developer portal that supports all of them, right? Mm -hmm. Today, it, today it gives you rest and soap kinds of things, and tomorrow maybe events and and, and other stuff, right? It, so it gives yeah. it gives GraphQL now too because I, yeah, I remember well that well. 
Yeah. I remember last year AKD is Helsing, there was a very heated discussion between uh, IBM and, and WSO2 guys oh, yeah. <laughs> who are going in for it with each other with the GraphQL API trend. Yeah, I, I mean, I, you know, GraphQL is another really hot item <laughs> that everybody wants to talk about. We're, we're pretty happy with what we've done there. Um, no, no, yeah. it was great. And, and yeah. it was kind of the first. Uh, Kind of opening on 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 that side outside of the GraphQL servers, for example, and and one thing about the design, I, I come back to what you said in the very beginning of this panel that uh, you should avoid uh, the the kind of showing up the implementation, tying the the API design to the implementation, and and that's what I'm seeing a lot in the GraphQL kind of world that there are these hazards and other things that are kind of great, but it's kind of like oh my god, we are we are pushing the database schema on, on, on the APIs. What <laughs> happened? Does this younger generation of people do not like, ha, do they have to learn everything <laughs> again you know, or it, something? That, that's <laughs> one of the things that drives me crazy about GraphQL. And, 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 and you know, people do the, the lowest common denominator, which is, okay, you yeah. want it, here you go, right? And, 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 and that brings to the topic I think we're about to get to, which is security. I mean, yes. you, you know, yeah. you're, you're, you're exposing your, your you know, database schema. I mean, exactly. this is not a good idea. <laughs> you know? Yeah, I mean, like, it's a security issue, but it's also a reversion management, change management issue, because once people get tied up in your, your attributes and your endpoints and your data model, then they will not let go. It's like that much harder. And if you decide that, oh, it's not good to store this data here, we'll do it other, in another place. And then your API is like changed because of your data storage issue. So yeah. how's that? Okay, but going towards the security. So we have a, a, a question from, uh, Alexander, but actually, uh, kind of, there's a there are two particular questions. So there's this uh, JWT, so JWT um, token is is the current standard for sending signed encrypted payloads in REST APIs. Um, but all security experts point that it's insecure. So who's working on suitable replacement and 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 kind of. There's also this Alexander's question is tying into that. It's it's about how to actually handle this kind of personal data, uh, for example, transfer in APIs. So there's in general with APIs being um, signed and encrypted, and then there's the kind of is this a solution to avoiding transmitting the data between different uh, security servers or other third parties in between. Any thoughts on this? Yeah, so I, I am not a deep security expert, so I'm going to start off by saying that, right? So, you know, I, I, and I'm probably going to skirt a lot of the, the, the detail on this question. So I, I did write a, um, a paper, and I'll, I'll put the link in, in the chat, uh, called Principles for API Security. And, and you know, I think I, this is one of the questions that we got to see ahead of time. Somebody submitted it ahead, so I read it, and I said, you know, what do I think the answer is to this? And, and, and the, I started to think about what's secure data. And then secure data is data that's been erased and written over 20 times, right? I mean, it, you know, other than that, if it actually still exists as data, it, it, it potentially can be accessed. And, but, and, and once somebody can access it, there's a possibility that somebody can access it who shouldn't be accessing it. So, so the question is, what do you do about that? And, 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 and the answer is you do multiple things about that. You don't try to solve something with one um, part of security. And JWT or whatever you, you like it, it is a part of a, a security solution. It's not the whole security solution. And, and so in the paper, you know, I, I, I talk about um, using multiple security layers as a way to... Um, to deal with with these issues, right? For, and, and, and you know, it starts off with strategy around security and gets into some basic API security things, and then into um, um, you know viewability and 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 act. So think about it from you know who's trying to access it, the authentication. What are they allowed to do, and uh, are they doing things that they're not allowed to do? Auditing afterward. And, and and not just one piece is going to solve the, the whole 
the whole problem. Because if you're just thinking about JWT and ignoring the other pieces that go around it, then, then you're right. It's not going to be as secure as, as it could be. But if you, um, and, and the other thing we're doing, um, and we're doing it today with uh, uh, Ping, um, is using AI to recognize um, things that are happening, right? So, so you know, we partner with Ping and, um, and, and as part of the API flow coming in, we're seeing patterns that somebody's trying to do that are matching patterns that bad people do. And, and therefore we're not gonna allow it, even though you're an authorized uh, authenticated user. You, your ID may have been stolen, right? And, and, and now you're trying to do things like um, see the limits of, uh, uh, of an API or, you know, access other accounts that are not yours or, you know, things like that, that, that you know, you wouldn't normally do. And so there's a lot that goes into this. And, and the, the basic answer is don't rely on one form of security to be your entire security. Uh, you, you need more than that. And I'll, I'll pop the... Uh, like yeah, to. I think yeah, I think that the kind of exactly like that, and and what we've heard, and what has been kind of commonly approached, for example, in in um, the X road, and 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 what we heard about the delivery side is that there are kind of these secure servers uh, or like server instances on each end. So you are kind of both securing the transmission and and the network layer, and and then you're also uh, kind of encrypting the message and of course using token based and, and kind of well, all the uh, certificates and, and other uh, related technologies for the encryption yeah. and, and yeah. The encrypting like, like Petri uh, was saying that they are using this uh, technique of encrypting the uh, uh, business information inside the message so it's not enough to kind of just say that well this is authenticated or it's not it, uh, it, it just enough to say that hey, um, uh, you know, if you if you can't access the API, it's it's safe, but it's also kind of the immutability of the message. So uh, yeah, I mean the other thing I I, I think I, really I talk right. about exposure yeah. of the you know who can see the even that the API exists right you know and yeah, and, and, exactly. and, and, and 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 don't expose like we were just saying in GraphQL. The back end structures, right? You know, yeah. nobody should know what your back end looks like. And, and, and the more you don't let people see things that they don't need to see, the more secure you're going to be, right? And, and that's. Yeah, I would, I would, I would in, in public sector mode, I would like uh, be very careful in, in mixing context, uh, kind of like there are these needs where, you know, it needs to be military grade security. And then you think about like where are your servers, and you think about where does the network like where's the network routed from, and and all of that. Then there's like the between <laughs> layer of of a of a gray area where where very very good security and very very good privacy is enough, but it doesn't need to be military grade. And then there's the kind of consumer grade stuff, and I think that if we try to use exactly the same techniques for everything that I'm seeing in public service. There's, there's often that discussion of like which cloud is safe cloud or is cloud a safe cloud at all. This is the same kind of thing that how should you, like there is no one size fits all, but if you, you want to go somewhere then this uh, token based and JSON web encryption and, and, and these levels are pretty good. They are in the kind of middle layer of things as assuming uh, that you were uh, HTTP, uh, S, uh, and SSL uh, certificates are still valid and you're using HTTPS and you're using kind of all these protocol level securities and you have proper authentication for your users because what I'm seeing a lot is that people still use, you know, client ID secret or API key uh, authentication and not token based because they think the API is going to be only used server to server. But that is not the case. I mean, if you have anything that is, is a mobile app or IoT device or is, is, is in a car or washing machine or whatever, it's going to be exposed as an API, no matter what the uh, kind of um, encryption or what the, the level of, of um, network security there is. And, and that's something that private sector actually 
is, is very bad at, at the moment. There have been a lot of leaks because of that, uh, but we should not replicate that in the public sector too. So that's kind of, it might sound obvious to this audience here because we have so many people who are kind of really deep into this, but it isn't obvious to all the others that we have to all work with. <laughs> so I just want to kind of emphasize that. Lauren, well, you know, do you have... Yeah. One, yeah. One, one example, I, this just always struck me as funny. I, I, it's not a public sector one, but, but you know, yeah. it's, a, it, it, it's the, these uh, auto manufacturers that want to have the mobile app that does things with their car, right? And, 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 and so you can unlock the doors and start it and do all the kinds of things to warm it up in the wintertime and, and, and all that. And, and that's wonderful stuff. But they were using such bad security around some of these things that, you know, I, I wrote a, a blog about this a couple of years ago now that says, you know, a person walks up to a car and hit, hits a button on their phone and the doors unlock and they get in and hit another button on their phone and the car starts and off they drive. The problem is they weren't the owner of the car. And, and you know, um, if you're not doing things that, that are securing this, this access, um, people are going to steal, you know, the, the, the interface and, and, and yeah. you know, and, and, and and simulate it and, and do things they're not supposed to do. Yeah, and I, I think there, there's a Roberto's comment about Jot being able to um, be implemented in an insecure way, and that, that is true, it should be implemented correctly, but also, for example, for authentication and encryption purposes, it should be uh, used with, with OpenID Connect, for example, instead of OAuth 2. Uh, there's clear difference in terms of security there. SAML is the uh, most unsecure, in, insecure thing, then OAuth 2, then OpenID Connect. There was even research about that that, that uh, we found in API Economy 101 uh, process. And, and then there's also the, the thing that I learned actually when my first implementation of IBM API Connect, and this is like a coincidence here, but but really like the, the introspection and, and all of that stuff. So when you kind of start having the API management solution and you really want to make sure that all the APIs and the microservices are kind of secure, then that you have that token and the token information validated in the API management layer. And, and then you pass the token into the service and the services should implement it uh, properly to kind of decrypt it and, and, and use that information to identify what they should and should not be doing. So there are so many issues here that should be kind of considered and, and now we're uh, starting to get to the end of things. So Lorenzino, do you have any great conclusions on the security? Uh, actually, topic? about the security, I think you, you, you have described it very well. The, what are the technical issues, let's say. And I also see that there are many people uh, that are uh, proposing different solutions to solve these uh, security yeah. uh, issues from the technical uh, uh, point of view. And also I have uh, seen the, uh, the um, presentation of, of uh, the, all the presentation, but in particular, the one of Petri that was discussing on how they saw this uh, security uh, exchange of uh, messages, let's say, protecting the content of the messages. What I mm -hmm. have to say that we have to, we, we discuss also with the, with Bogdan, with DigiDigit on how, and how to move from a secure, let's say, environment like the one of the delivery of the EID of the, the once only principal structures, the uh, infrastructure that we are using uh, to maybe Yes, a more uh, extensible and flexible and lightweight, let's say, way to uh, sh share information like the one of, proposed by the REST APIs, but we have to be sure that no information can be shared uh, with the people that are not, that don't have access to this information. No information can be combined to retrieve, for example, and to enter into the privacy of the people mm -hmm. and to retrieve wrong information, which is the main concern of the European uh, Commission, let's say, in this, in this uh, field. So we, we are paying a, a lot of attention that all the information are uh, reaching the right person or the right organization with the right level of information. And I think that um, I, see, I saw some uh, problems with the open data. I go back to the open data because the, I have quite uh, some experience on this. And sometimes we had problems with some data sets that we were sharing, thinking that, uh, I mean, they were 
perfectly fine to share them and to have the bulk download of these data sets. But then we discovered that combining some data set that we couldn't imagine, some people, they could find and, in, and retrieve some information that a human, for example, cannot be, cannot be able to, to understand or to retrieve, but mm -hmm. a, an artificial intelligence algorithm can do. So in my opinion, we have to pay attention on the design of APIs to share this mm -hmm. data set and to share this information, being sure and using this API to, um, let's say, share only the information and, and the ontology of this information, if we want mm -hmm. to, to, to use the word ontology or the semantics, let's say, only in the right way. And I see that the, uh, from the high level point of view, the, the application point of view, let's say, the API could be a very strong, uh, uh, strong uh, tool to uh, kind of uh, share this data set in, in the right way. This is what, uh, what, uh, what I think at least. Yes, and, and, and to just to point out that the information that might be accidentally shared might be in the headers and not in the body of the API. And I've seen a lot of cases where the audit logs, for example, because some processes require a lot of logging and then stuff that is not supposed to be logged gets logged. And then you can combine interesting things. Um, okay, so now we are very, very near to closing this uh, event. And Monica, are you there? Am I, I am, yes. Great. If, if you just let me share uh, the, 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 my, because I'm... Are you not? Able to no, I don't see the sharing. Yes, you, you, start yes, share. Yes, yes, they they, they should, have. Yes. Okay, but before you share, I think that we should, uh, unless you have questions for us still, you're closing up now, aren't you? Yeah, I mean, as uh, I, I was just trying to put some uh, some slides in the in the background, uh, but uh, please uh, use this yeah, opportunity I was just to, going to say. Yeah, I was just going to say that. Uh, we should probably thank our panelists, Alan here and, and Lorenzino, and uh, thank you, Monica and Lorenzino, for, for um, getting us here. And, and it has been a nice journey. And I think that we should let Alan get some naps or something. You know? <laughs> so, uh, thank you from my behalf. And Monica, please take it away. Um, yeah having problems uh, with the other computer again. <sighs> Let well, me just... We are talking about technical problems today, so I... I, I yeah, that... <laughs> <laughs> Let I mean, me it, just... APIs do, yes. cannot solve everything, huh? Yes. <laughs> yes, <laughs> and the other day I found, I found porridge in my HDMI, and that was not an API solvable problem to handle, so sometimes Scratch, yeah. all things happen. Let's try with Firefox. Share. Uh, no, you just. Should be okay. Okay, while, while you're sorting that out and maybe Lorenzino can share something, uh, I think that we have a lot of great discussion in the chat and a lot of kind of enthusiastic people planning to yeah. connect and, and continue the work. And we had uh, actually some ideas of, of uh, that could be going into the standardization work today. And I hope that we had some private sector people there also that were joining in. So now we have the slide. So, yes. So, uh, Lorenzino, you are sharing your screen, or who, who is sharing the screen? Am I? Uh, it's it's me. Okay. No. Uh, yeah. Okay. I mean, yeah, just tell me what you want to yeah, show because we have the. Uh, no. Yeah. Please. Okay. Yeah. The the, the point was that I wanted to to make a presentation, so I'm going just to to talk about it because. Uh, with this, uh, with the Mac, it's not that easy to get the, the permission to, to share the, the screen. Um, so, yes, well, the closing remarks is just to thank you all uh, for, for this amazing uh, event. 
it's been uh, very rewarding for for us as organizing as organizers to see um, how lively discussions have been in the chat in the discussion panels and uh, the amazing presentations uh, that, that that we've got um, uh, for us, uh, our main takeaways is uh, uh, the, the, the material that we've got from, from you, from the presenters, the knowledge that you have shared with uh, uh, coming from, uh, from experts um, on, on versioning microservice, metadata of APIs, uh, design topics, um, um, how different, uh, how the, the, the integration versus ecosystem approaches to API infrastructure, uh, which is linked with digital maturity, will, will evolve. And uh, it's, it's really very interesting um, uh, to, 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 for, for us to, to have all these conclusions. Um, as aftermath to this event, we will, be, uh, we will collect all the, all the presentations and the materials and we will publish it on our um, API for DT collection that we have, that we have created. Um, maybe, um, uh, Lorenzino, can you share the link to, to, the, to it? Um, yes, uh, just yes. a moment, please. Uh, no, I mean to the you? collection because uh, it will take us a while to process all the information. So our idea is to put there all the presentations, and then we will do we will summarize the highlights of the event, including the analysis of um, of the fruitful charts uh, and the Slido outputs, and try to make a um, um, yeah a briefing and, and, and summary uh, out of it. Um, I also wanted you to seize the opportunity to, to let uh, those of you who do not know that uh, our API for Digital Government reports uh, have seen the, 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 the air uh, last week, finally, um, and uh, we, we have already our Science for Policy report uh, on uh, how APIs um, the role of APIs in, in, in digital government. Um, we, we have also the framework uh, of APIs that uh, Mark Boyd was presenting at the beginning of the event and a self-assessment tool for those uh, public administration or even other organizations um, that can use to, to understand um, the maturity of their, um, of their API infrastructure according to the, the, the proposed framework that we, we, that we, that we launched. And uh, with this, um, again, just to thank each and every one of you for all your, um, for all, all your contribution to this event. Uh, letting you know that we are planning, as I said at the beginning, this is only the first of a series of events. We will organize um, uh, this year another two. One will be in, uh, in the API Days conference in London. We will organize a, work and a specific workshop. And uh, if you are interested, uh, you, we will, you will get information about it very, very soon. And then uh, we will also organize a public sector track uh, in API Days uh, conference in Paris at the end of the year in December. So um, thank you very much. Uh, and um, I really hope that this uh, conversation and dialogue uh, keeps alive and that uh, we bring uh, the, the, the discussion on, on the API topics as the connecting uh, the, the connectivity tissue of the digital um, uh, sphere um, operational and working in some time in the future.